Hi. Um, it's very nice to be here. <clears throat> um, one important, probably the most important line to my bio that was not mentioned is that I'm a proud member of the Massachusetts Society of Professors and the Massachusetts Teachers Association, <clears throat> for which I've been an, an, a very active uh, member now for 30 years. This is my 30th year at, at UMass Amherst. So I, th I think uh, I'm going to e even shorten my remarks in the interest of, of time and maybe just um, emphasize some points from my talk that really uh, dovetail with what you've heard from all the other panelists. <clears throat> so the perspective that, that I take in terms of my uh, research and teaching is uh, the importance of the social determinants, the non-medical factors that, that shape health outcomes. So these are factors like <clears throat> economic inequality, like racism, like conditions of work, that are prior to access to healthcare. So access to healthcare matters, but the social determinants matter more, as, as um, at least two of the panelists have already mentioned. One of the key, um, one of the key insights that have, that's come out of the field of social epidemiology is this notion of the gradient, that no matter which particular health outcome you choose, arthritis, cardiovascular disease, infant mortality, schizophrenia, anxiety, it always follows this pattern. If, if on one axis you have the health outcome and the other axis you have some measure of social status in the statistical models, it's usually income, education, or occupation. It always has this step ladder fashion. The, the bottom does worse than the middle, the middle does worse than the top. If you then employ an intersectional lens, what you typically find is that whites and blacks say at comparable income, educational, or occupational points, you see a class gradient for both populations, but at each comparable point, blacks or other racial, racially minoritized populations tend to do worse. So um, that, that's uh, sort of the place where a lot of my work starts. Next slide. Oh. <laughs> I forgot I have the clicker. Um, here's another important point, very provocative point. So these are trends in the, the red line is union density over time. Probably many of you in this room are familiar with this. This is from the Economic Policy uh, Institute. So we're looking at union density in the red line. We're looking at the share of income going to the top 10% uh, in the top line. Okay, so this slide may not be unfamiliar to you know, members of this audience. Um, maybe um, what m might be uh, familiar or less familiar is uh, an accumulating body of research that suggests that the degree of economic inequality makes us sick, right? So it matters to individuals and groups, your economic standing and resources, but when you compare the United States against other wealthy nations, we're easily the sickest. Um, if we take whites as a population alone in, in the United States, whites would rank around 24th in the nation, uh, sorry, in the world, <laughs> sorry. Um, okay, so, okay, next slide. Um, the the uh, fundamental determinants of social status derive from key social movements. You know, we, we're focusing here on, on labor, but I would add the civil rights movement and highlight some uh, aspects of this slide that comes out of research that I'm doing with Javier Rodriguez. So this is looking at, um, the, the metric is excess black mortality, right? So these are blacks that die in a particular year who would not have died if their rates were the same as whites adjusting for gender and age. So you can see that coming out of the 1960s, black excess deaths are somewhere around 47,000 and there's a steep downward trajectory, like a downward slope. Health is improving relative to whites. Rodriguez and I estimate the dotted line suggests that had we stayed on that trajectory, right, that was initiated during this period of labor and civil rights struggle, we would have eliminated these vexing and perplexing racial disparities by the early 2000s. 
but what you see <laughs> designated uh, as, as the, the section of the graph under A is the Reagan and Bush administration, right? This is the neoliberal turn, and you can see a sharp up, uptick in black excess mortality, which is then followed by, again, a convergence of black-white death rates, right? So the convergence, the downward slope means that that black health is gaining to whites, right? It's a kind of relative um, um, feature. So again, um, if, you, if you think about the trend line from the 1960s going to 1980, I mean, this was not reparations. This was not a period of radical economic distribution in the United States. What do we point to? We point to things like Medicare and Medicaid in 1965, the community health movement, um, this is the period of the war on poverty. This is the, the period where we advance the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, uh, Head Start. The, the point is that it was a period of federal intervention that was, tack that was tackling both economic and racial inequality. And you see the manifestation of, of health. Health is an ex exquisite embodiment of social status, uh, as, as I uh, suggested in, in, the, in, the, in the first um, slide. Now, when Javier and I looked at this the first time, we thought that this was a simple story, right? That civil rights, black power, labor, good. Reagan, bad. <laughs> Clinton, good. But of course, Clinton wasn't so good. Clinton ended a, fair, a federal guarantee of a subsidy to the poor right, um, with the uh, uh, ending of, of AFDC. Uh, Clinton um, established the policies that have led to the acceleration of mass incarceration in the United States. So it clearly wasn't that Clinton and that administration were doing good things from a policy standpoint for black people. What it turns out is that he was doing bad things from a macroeconomic perspective for white people, three minutes. So around 1998, um, the economists at, at Princeton, Angus Deaton, and Ann Case have been documenting this trend they call uh, deaths by despair. So white working class health has taken a downward turn since the mid-1990s, and that is directly tied to NAFTA and, and other trade policies that made <clears throat> certain counties in, in, the, in the Rust Belt uh, vulnerable to trade, um, you know, uh, to China and other places. And so in that time, we can see here that the, the red line is U.S. white death rate. So there's actually an upward trend in white mortality from about 1998. Remember, NAFTA w was enacted in 1992. And, and look at the trend compared to death rates in other wealthy nations, France, Germany, the U.K., Canada, Australia, Sweden, and so forth. So. What is manifest more pronouncedly among racially minoritized populations, indigenous populations, is also implicating the majority of whites in the United States. So I don't quite know how to conclude um, my point, but I think that all roads, you know, all roads lead to the same direction, right? That this is the organizing challenge before us, the um, health outcomes of the nation as, as the whole for racially minorita minoritized populations, but even for populations supposedly protected by white privilege, need the protections of workers' rights and the labor movement. So that's where I'll stop.